Uh, it's a pleasure to introduce Paul Taylor, uh, Global Head of Shipping and Offshore at Societe Generale, uh, who will lead the discussion. I want to also mention uh, again that we've incorporated uh, a lot of the questions we've received in the development of the agenda into the panel discussion, uh, so we won't be taking questions at the end. And a final reminder, or a reminder, that there is a CLNG uh, handout in our handout section at your control bar. It's the 2021 outlook uh, for LNG, a view from the bridge. With that, Paul, I turn the panel over to you. Thank you. Mike, th thank you. Thank you very much. Um, a pleasure to um, moderate this panel. So welcome, gentlemen. Welcome to everybody who's, who's dialed in. Um, let me introduce the panel straight away. Um, first of all, we have Peter Keller, um, name may be very well known to you, Executive Vice President of TOTE and Chairman of CLNG. We have Torsten Schramm, who is President Maritime of DNV GL. And we have Jakob Granquist, who is Sales Director at Gassum. So welcome, guys. Um, as as Mike just said, you know what a what a prelude really um, the the, the Hapag Lloyd um, video um, is to to this panel discussion, and it should hopefully invite a very interactive discussion as, as we go through it. And LNG clearly has a, a major role to play, not just a tr as a transitional fuel, but as a, a fuel um, for, for, for the future. Um, such, a, such a positive um, news item, really, to, to listen to the, to the video, to hear about the investment in uh, six LNG-fueled, very, very large container ships for, for Hapag Lloyd. Um, and it, it's, it clearly underlines their own commitments to the energy transition. But you know, e even more positive than that um, are the, the green credentials, the green credentials rather, um, which come out of this, this investment. Um, why, you know, why are green credentials important? Well, Today, not only is it a good communication, of course, tool, but it also is an item which is going to drive investors in a certain direction. And in today's environment, and I speak as a as, as a financier, it's it's super important to have that green label against the investment. Investors today will go towards the sectors, the companies, the assets where where there is more of a green label. And I think the fact that today we can talk about LNG having that green label is going to be not just very good news for um, the likes of Hapag Lloyd, but for the sector um, in, in general, as um, we transit through um, to decarbonisation over the next a few, few decades. As a, as, as a banker um, and as Vice President of the Poseidon Principles Association, um, I also look at the green investments and see that as really, really important. Um, we've all, the banks who have signed up the Poseidon principles have, have made a commitment to, to measure and report our, our carbon emissions on our portfolios going forwards. And this is going to drive investment because we're going to be um, looking at climate alignment within our credit decisions. And it's very, very positive that the first, through the first year of reporting on the Poseidon principles, it's clear to see that LNG fueled vessels score very well in terms of their annual efficiency ratios. Um, and that's going to drive investment for LNG ships, ships going forwards. It was very interesting also that uh, today, the, the press release of CLNG in terms of um, the, the positive impact that biofuel drop-in can have, a 10% biofuel drop-in can have in terms of extending the alignment runway of that AER score, which drives um, the IMO tra trajectories and also the Poseidon principles alignment. So quite clearly, again, LNG has um, a very, very clear um, role to play today and, and in the future. So lots of positive things, um, and we're going to discuss those today. Um, uh, of course, the world isn't all, in po all positive about LNG. There's some people who um, prefer to wait and they look for the zero carbon fuels of the future, such as hydrogen, ammonia, methanol. Um, but and that leads me to the first question. And um, I'm going to uh, address that to the Torsten, if I may. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's great news um, that Hapag Lloyd has invested in these six 23,500 TU container ships, um, as did um, CMA CGM 
as well before. But there does appear to be this reluctance across the sector to invest in new ships, invest in new technologies. There's a wait and see attitude, maybe a, a concern over first mover risk. But to what extent is, is waiting a questionable alternative, Torsten? And what benefits can LNG bring to reducing the greenhouse gas emissions now and in the future? Thanks, Paul, for the question and thanks for having me on the panel. Of course, the pressure to lower emissions and improve efficiency will be one of the big drivers over the next 30 years, especially from existing tightening and future regulations. Ships built today will have to compete with vessels coming into the market in 5, 10 or 15 years time and must consider future standards to remain competitive. That's why shipping needs to act now in order to meet 2030 and 2050 decarbonization targets. Waiting is indeed not an option. Coming to an LNG, it is safe, it is competitive and proven viable marine fuel offering greenhouse gas reduction benefits now and the regulatory flame framework is fully in place. The LNG bunkering infrastructure is growing fast and gaining traction to support wider use of the fuel across the main trade lanes. By gross tons, nearly 30% of vessels currently on order are, will be powered with alternative fuel propulsion. And this segment is clearly dominated by LNG, by dual-fueled engines. And LNG with the possibility of drop-in of bio-LNG is therefore a robust choice enabling future flexibility. So in a nutshell, and to answer your question, Paul, LNG should be on the ship owner's shortlist for a new building in the years to come. Thanks, Torsten. Thanks very much. And Jakob, if I could make, ask a similar question to you. You're, you're a sales director of LNG at Gassum. Uh, you're used to making some sales pitches for, for LNG, I guess. You know, why, why does it make sense to invest in LNG now and, and not wait? Thanks, Paul, and thanks for having me on, on, on this panel. Let's turn the question around a little bit uh, and let's ask ourselves, what would really be an alternative? Can you really afford not to do this? Because I think that, that when we talk about LNG as a fuel and, and you talk about it as an alternative fuel, I think that now we already see that LNG is becoming kind of mainstream. Uh, and it, it's not the the unknown out there somewhere and, and it's not any more a debate about availability. I, I think that Haben Jensen said it quite good in, in the interview that he doesn't believe that there will be any issues about supply. And if you really want to do anything now, the, then LNG is really the only viable option. And as you said earlier, Paul, in, in the introduction, to wait now for, for the silver bullet to come, I think that's just a, a bad excuse for not doing anything right now. Uh, and when we talk about LNG uh, as a fuel today, and, and really a little bit getting back to what Torsten said just recently, I think that you're, when you invest in a vessel, it's an asset that will last for at least 20 years. We look at icebreaker investments up in, in the Nordics right now, and, and then they are talking about the lifetime design of 50 years. So, so it's an investment that you have to live with. And, and what's interesting then for the investors, the finance institutions, but nevertheless for the ship owner itself, is how do you future-proof your asset so that it keeps the value right now in five years, 10 years, and throughout its lifespan. And here I think the story is so beautiful. And this is really, okay, I preach the word of LNG and I sell it. But still, I don't see the, the, the kind of the, the argument against it. When you have LBG coming on now, like liquid 
biogas. We already see that in the market, and that's something that we are promoting and selling each day. I don't know how many of you saw the, the news that Destination Gotland, the ferry operator between the island of Gotland and Sweden mainland, they are now blending in 10% on their total volume of LNG this year. So this is already a huge step forward, and, and it shows that it's not a solution for the future. It's something happening actually right now. Uh, and then when we look at the hydrogen solutions, the ammonia solutions, we shouldn't compare those with LNG, because then we're not comparing the right, <laughs> right apples with the right apples. We are comparing something completely different. So then we should uh, instead compare it with synthetic gas and synthetic methane that uh, they talked about in the Hapag Lloyd interview as well. So then you can compare apples to apples. And if you invest today in an asset that can burn meat and molecules, then you already have invested in an infrastructure that is existing. It's not a matter of supply. And you can easily inject biomolecules into that. And you can also inject synthetic molecules into that same logistics. So you have an asset that can like, not only bridge with biogas, but it can also operate on the synthetic molecules of tomorrow. So uh, I don't see any reason why you shouldn't go, if you want to do something right now, and now when you get green funding for, for your investments as well, I don't see really anything stopping you. And I have to agree with Torsten that there isn't any options really. Yeah, thanks, Jakob. I'll come to the sort of the more technical um, discussion of biofuel drop-ins um, in a little bit of time, um, but maybe a bit, a little bit more, Peter, about the, the here and now. First of all, um, you and I have discussed this, this many, many times, but we talk about the energy transition, um, but the the decarbonisation uh, debate in shipping appears to be more focused on the destination um, of where we want to be. Um, with little thought given to actually the pathway of how of how to get there, and you know, what are your reflections on this? And do you, do you actually see any risks or dangers to the industry by being a little bit too um, focused on the on the destination? Well, I think it. Thanks, Paul. I, I think it's important to understand that policymakers should not be prescriptive. Uh, they should be setting the goals. Uh, but they should not necessarily be telling industry or technology uh, how to get to those goals. So I think when 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 uh, when IMO and others uh, talk about 2030 guidelines and 2050 guidelines, I, I think that's probably the most appropriate way to go. What we have to understand, and 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 both Torsten and uh, Jacob uh, uh, mentioned this, is that. Right now, today, as, as we noted in the view from the bridge, and, and I think as, as, as Hapag Lloyd uh, noted, there really are no options. If we're going to do something, and we need to do something, I think everyone agrees with that, um, then right now, the only real option we have in front of us is liquefied natural gas, and then the pathway forward using bio and ultimately synthetic products. If we don't do that, what we're doing is making matters worse. We're exacerbating the current problems. And there's no getting that back. You can't go, go, go ahead three or four years and, and, and say, well, what I was waiting for didn't make matters worse. It does. It makes matters worse. And when we then, again, take into consideration uh, some of the things that uh, that were mentioned in, in, in the earlier interview with uh, with Heaven Janssen, uh, it is a proven product. LNG is a proven product. It's a stable product. It's a safe product. And as he noted, it, potentially long term, it's a very very competitive problem a product, especially as uh, as as heavy fuels uh, again continue to uh, to increase in cost. So yes. We need to I, we, we need to have policy statements that say we want to reduce greenhouse gas. We want to keep air quality at a very very high level. How do we get there? Let the industry and and let the technology take us there. And today, the only way we can get on that technology train, the only way we can get on that positive train, 
is to jump on uh, jump on the LNG car. Thanks, Peter. And it, I want to pick up on this a bit more on, on where you say about it being a proven product, and uh, and maybe go back to Torsten. But I'd actually be interested in all your views on this. Um, yeah, target. We all know what the target is. It's zero carbon fuels, and that day will come at some point. But we also know that bio LNG is now being tested, and it has a role to play in the marketplace. Um, Torsten, maybe first you can, you, can you share your experience with uh, the development of, of biofuels and, and the potential uh, commercial and environmental opportunities biofuels can deliver, um, including, and I think this is a very important point, including the, the scalability, cost and commercial viability of them? Oh, thanks, Paul. Uh, let me um, uh, state first that uh, LNG, and that is unlike for most other uh, fuels um, uh, coming into uh, the site, the regulatory picture with the IMO IGF code for LNG, which came into force on January 1st, 2017, is settled. So that's already stated and that is fact. If bio LNG or synthetic LNG with lower carbon footprint are becoming more available in the future, they can start immediately replacing the LNG we use today. As bio and synthetic LNG are in operation not different from the LNG we use today. We have already some vessels in class, Jacob also mentioned an example, that have conducted the first successful tests of bunkering LNG blended with bio LNG. So that is possible already now. Marine biofuels are not currently used in any significant volumes yet. But over the last year, there has been a lot of testing of various types of biofuels by many ship operators. And this includes, of course, liquefied gas replacing LNG. From a technical perspective, the experience is generally good, but main barriers are the fuel costs, the availability, and a lack of a clear regulatory framework also in the future. Marine biofuels are currently up to twice as expensive as uh, conventional fuels, which is an important barrier for any ship operator who wants to use these fuels now. Most biofuels today are supplied through ports uh, in the Netherlands, and uh, so we have to see that other suppliers uh, are catching up. And uh, however, in respect to the price levels, we might see future regulations, we might see future mechanisms, and uh, these uh, mechanisms could mean that uh, biofuels become more price uh, uh, competitive uh, compared to the fuels and the LNG we use today. In if you're looking into the studies available, uh, it is uh, um, stated that uh, by 2030, there will be potentially a, a huge amount of uh, biofuel available. And this could be uh, enough uh, to support the supply for the uh, uh, marine industry and shipping. Of course, this uh, uh, potential uh, is due to production, the market factors, competition with other sectors, uh, also aviation, for instance. They are looking uh, to use uh, biofuels uh, uh, to some extent and pricing. And this has a large uh, impact uh, on the uh, expected production and availability of shipping. Yeah. So, in a nutshell, we are looking forward and we are prepared to use uh, bio LNG already now, 
uh, and uh, this could be then added and uh, also dropped in and blended with the future uh, synthetic uh, uh, LNG, where you have then possibly the hydrogen uh, infrastructure and uh, feedstock in place uh, from the shore side. So, uh, as, as said, um, we can start with uh, drop in bio LNG immediately. Right. Tulsa, no, thank you. I, I'd just like to ask either Peter or Jakob if you want to um, respond to that, because when I speak to the odd detractor of LNG and um, the argument about biofuels, it always comes down to commercial viability and the, the lack of volume available to make it viable. Uh, have you got any sort of follow up to that? Let me, just, <laughs> let me just jump in for a second. Uh, you know, at, at CLNG a year or so ago, we had uh, the University of Delft. Uh, do a, uh, a detailed study on the availability of bio long term, and and clearly uh, there's a uh, there's there's a tremendous amount of material around. Uh, call it waste, call it human waste, animal waste, vegetative waste, uh, that really represents another global issue uh, that that does not receive uh, nearly enough attention, and that waste can be very effectively uh, converted uh, into uh, into bioproducts. I see uh, in the in the US, for example, uh, I know of hundreds of millions of dollars that's being invested right now into uh, many areas of animal uh, waste in order to digest that and turn that into, uh, into, into bio LNG. And when you do that, then of course you're also uh, capturing what would otherwise be uh, uh, be released in the atmosphere. So you basically get a double whammy, if you will, in terms of, of, of the benefits. So there's, there's no question that this is a very, very viable product. There's no question that it's a very positive uh, product. It does not have the ca carbon molecule. Uh, so it, it does in fact provide that pathway, that gateway uh, forward to, uh, to a zero, uh, to a zero carbon environment. And when you look at what proponents of other alternative fuels are suggesting in terms of investment, we hear again numbers in the trillions being bantied about for certain alternative fuels. Um, I think we can likely uh, build the bio LNG environment uh, a lot cheaper than that and I'm going to come back I'm going to come back to that very point in a little bit of time Peter so um hold hold fire on that point um <laughs> Jacob um do we do you yeah. want to follow up yeah I, I I could have a few comments on this well Gasum is the the biggest producer of biogas in in the Nordics uh, and we are constantly investing in more plants to to produce biogas and, and we are far from sold out. So there's a lot of product available for maritime customers as well. Uh, and I think that we need to look at this in a perspective of what the, are the alternatives really? I mean, there's a lot of talk about biofuels also on the conventional side, but with the subsidies of the transport sector today, I mean, the, the road transport is eating up all those biodiesel volumes and it isn't so easy. Uh, I have a background in the oil refinery industry as well, and it, and it it isn't so easy to find good biofuels that are compatible with or blendable with heavy fragments of oil. So you easily get into a discussion that can you blend those biodiesels that are on the market right now and, and the products alike, the distillate products, with heavier fragments uh, that are being used now on the 0.5 product range. So you come easily into compatibility issues and that you don't have at all with bio LNG and LNG as such. Mm. So, mm. so there's a completely different, different scenario and also availability of product when we talk about gas compared to the conventional side. Yeah, and Jakob, just if I may move slightly on, but staying, staying with you and staying with biofuels, um, you know, ensuring safety um, when, when it comes to uh, future f future fuels um, is, is essential. And uh, how does um, LNG's use today provide a base for the future safe use of bio LNG and synthetic LNG? As mentioned earlier, Paul, the, the molecule is the same. 
So it's still, even though it's a bio LNG molecule, or if it's an LNG molecule, the mo it's a methane molecule. So it behaves in exactly the same way if it's bio or if it's fossil. And also the synthetic molecule is exactly the same molecule. And I would say that, that the bunker industry, when you talk about conventional versus LNG, it has never been safer when you talk about LNG. There are so many, I would say, guidelines and restrictions and regulations in place for LNG bunkering today. And that would account for bio as well, that uh, it's a really safe working environment. I mean, before we bunker a new customer, we have bunkered that customer on paper like several times before the actual operation. We do all kinds of, of risk uh, analysis. We do mooring studies, compatibility studies, all of this. And that is never heard of in conventional bunkering. I mean, pretty much anybody who can afford to buy a secondhand barge can start bunkering conventional fuels. But the hurdle to start using and start being a supplier of LNG is quite a lot higher, which means also that you have more serious players and bigger players. I wouldn't say that bigger is always beautiful, but at least it takes the standard up quite a few notches compared to what we see, see in the conventional bunker business. Yeah, that's being a sea, I have yeah. a background as a master mariner, it, and it, it, you see a lot of funny stuff going on when you take bunkers in, in all kinds of ports all around the world. And I think that this is something now, now it's a time to do new, do new things and develop an industry that really has been rubbish before. Yeah. Excuse me for saying that, but, but that's how, how I see it. Yeah, no, thanks, Jacob, and uh, that's very clear. And uh, Peter, you you were going to talk about uh, the zillions um, to be saved on on LNG, and here's here's your here's your moment. But um, in terms of LNG infrastructure, you know, it's it's been building up for for decades. Um, we've we've seen a significant growth in in bunkering infrastructure, which you know a lot about yourself, um, as well as dual fuel engine and, and, and supply systems as well, capable um, of using LNG, LNG fuel. Um, how could this development uh, pave the way for other alternative fuels? Well, for, first, first of all, we've been almost 50 years, if not longer, uh, developing LNG as a viable fuel. And, and, and we know now the infrastructure is, is, is there. Uh, even HEPAC noted that. Uh, I'm told that uh, by about 2022, we can expect 170 ports around the world having LNG bunkering capabilities. So, so that's that's pretty robust. Um, as 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 that infrastructure is in place, and as we have these dual fuel engines, as technology changes, and a decade or or, or more from now, if there are alternative fuels uh, like synthetic LNG. Uh, that 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 can use the same sort of uh, infrastructure, and and that don't need special uh, handling as as let's say hydrogen as a super cryogenic might, uh, or as ammonia might because of its toxicity. Uh, then certainly that infrastructure is going to work. Gas is going to be gas as 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 we go forward. So what we're developing today and what we've developed for the last 50 years, uh, as we see today, is provides the background and, and, and a strong foundation uh, to, to the house we're building uh, that is LNG. And, and then that house is going to include rooms for, for bio LNG and synthetic products and, and, and the carbon neutral products uh, as, as we go forward. So there's no question that what we're doing today uh, is, is, is going to help future-proof uh, the investments that uh, your bank and uh, and others uh, are are supporting the industry with. Yeah, and, and in a second, I mean, Torsten's going to uh, um, uh, tell us about what he thinks about the um, savings that um, LNG can provide against other fuels, where there'll be huge cost requirements to build up the uh, the infrastructure, and we're talking trillions of dollars. Peter, do you do you have? I know you do. So, could you give us um, your your views on on the saving that LNG might just give compared with other uh, other fuels and then of course i'll ask torsten the same question well we 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 know 
as operators, as, as someone who has operated uh, CLNG vessels and been, been part of that process, uh, we, 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 we know that LNG prices are relatively fixed long term as compared to, uh, as compared to uh, fo regular fossil fuels, what we've experienced over the, over the last many, many decades. And as, as, uh, as Haben Janssen mentioned, uh, prices are, are up again. And, and yet LNG, forgetting the anomaly in, in Singapore, LNG is a very, very stable fuel. It's very plentiful. Uh, so we know that long term it's going to be available. We've also got almost all the, the work and the technology there because it's been active. It's been active many years, as I mentioned. So we're not develop, we're not going down a technology stream where we don't know what's going to happen. We also have a complete life cycle analysis on LNG, well to wake uh, analysis, and we have none of that on any of the other alternatives that technology is looking at. So we really don't even understand what the unintended consequences of some of these fuels may be in a maritime environment or in a tra transportation environment. So there's a tremendous amount of work and expense, and again, people have suggested trillions of dollars, uh, that needs to, to happen as we look at these alternatives. Yet today, we can develop 21 to 28 percent uh, savings in greenhouse gases. We can ensure clean air um, if we move ahead right now. And then we'll see what happens. We'll see what technology comes forward with. We'll see what the, what, what the life cycle analysis of some of these alternatives look like 10, 20 years from now. Yeah. And we know that the process that we've started will be workable with other gases. Thanks, Peter. Torsten, sorry, I should have come to you first, but um, have you, do you have anything to add to that in terms of the opportunity for an LNG infrastructure to be built at a much lower cost? Yeah, uh, of course. First of all, uh, the technology, the regulations, the infrastructure is already in place and further building up and developing rapidly. Uh, please refer also to our uh, alternative fuel insight platform where you can uh, see this daily, how this is uh, evolving. Also, you can have a view there on the uh, stable LNG uh, prices, uh, as mentioned uh, by Peter, uh, so that you have a good uh, overview. Also, the technology is uh, uh, developing. Uh, one um, uh, key factor in, in, in the investment uh, of the LNG technology is, of course, uh, the tank, uh, the containment. And there we see also very modern developments uh, for instance, coming from Korea, we see uh, new containment systems uh, uh, coming into the game where we can uh, integrate uh, uh, such a containment system for the safe carriage uh, of LNG as fuel on board ships uh, within the uh, ship structure there in, in line with our yeah. rules. And of course, uh, as the number of uh, larger vessels and uh, um, we have seen the example from Hapag Lloyd and uh, uh, others, of course, too. Running on alternative and on LNG fuel uh, could spark a real step change for the industry. Um, so if the number of these larger vessels is doubling, and we can see this uh, uh, when we follow the uh, ordering situation, this could result in a significant increase and then also in fuel supplies. And this will help create the demand uh, that continues to put out and, and, and the expansion of the uh, 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 bunkering infrastructure uh, uh, along the major shipping ports and lanes. And uh, of course, it also gives uh, confidence uh, for owners uh, to look for, uh, uh, for LNG as fuel for the next vessel. And uh, when you see that the bunkering is placed and they're building up. And uh, I refer to our AFI, our Alternative Fuels Insight, uh, and I just checked it uh, today. About uh, uh, 50 pure LNG bunkering vessels are in operation or on order presently. So from this you can see there's a search coming up and it's apparent and uh, uh, more will come. 
So this uh, is also then speeding up uh, the whole uh, process. And uh, as I mentioned with the examples of the, uh, the LNG price and also on the, let's say, factor of the containment of uh, the tanks, uh, uh, there are also some, let's say, technological developments helping uh, uh, that uh, LNG is uh, getting even more competitive uh, also price-wise. Thanks, Torsten. I'm just conscious of the time, I, I do want to touch upon the very exciting uh, subject of regulation, uh, but it is an important subject. And um, there are various um, regulatory policies, um, such as the EU taxonomy, the ETS um, initiatives, there's commercial initiatives such as the, the CBI um, in, in setting the, the green definition. But you know, my question, and maybe I could actually address this to um, Jakob first, um, and 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 just just quite quick answers, guys. Um, are the regulators inside the industry and outside the industry doing enough for the energy transition, and and also the role LNG can play within this transition? Jakob, maybe I could throw that question at you first. Yeah, quick answer. No, I think that there could be a lot more done for the environment as such. But, but I would twist it around again a little bit. And, and what we see now in the market is, okay, there are targets for CO2 emissions and so on. But what we see now, and I think this is much more important that, that, than regulations, is that the customers of the ship owners, the freight owners, and the bigger industry, especially up here in the Nordics, they are starting to demand actions from the ship owners. So we have a few customers of ours that, that they have built or are building LNG vessels right now because they couldn't charter in anything else for their customers. So they had to do this and it was not due to regulations, it was through customer and consumer demand. And I think that this is very important, but still, I do think that we could see more regulations that would favor fuels such as LNG, as it's quite a leap from what we have today when we talk about conventional fuels, scrubbers, etc. But yeah. please- Even though, even though it's great news, of it's great news, of course, that um, you know, Hapag Lloyd have got the the green the green definition yes. under the CBI, but it's obviously that that's just one commercial initiative. Yes. Um, if, if, I, or, if, I, if I may, I, I think I think it's important the regulators understand that the deep sea fleet is a global fleet and needs to be regulated on a global basis. Uh, short sea shipping, local shipping, different story. <laughs> that can be regulated locally uh, but the deep sea fleet is 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 a is a global enterprise and and it needs to be regulated as such by imo and and, and global uh, and global global structures yeah that's also in a nutshell uh, the position and the view of dnvgl we believe that the imo is the best vehicle for establishing safety and environmental rules for the maritime industry and uh, um, uh, we need a global level playing field and uh, 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 regional or local restrictions uh, are uh, um, uh, not in favor uh, of uh, global shipping. So we need uh, global um, uh, rules uh, to uh, applicable. However, um, there's nothing against if the EU initiatives are then uh, channeled through the IMO or if uh, uh, regional or local initiatives uh, add and complement uh, the rules uh, by incentives, this could also further um, uh, ramp up uh, uh, the uh, implementation of uh, LNG as fuels on board ships. Thanks, thanks, thanks Torsten. I, I have two final questions um, before I'm, I'm timed out. And uh, the first one I'm going to ask Peter, the second one and final one I'm going to ask everybody. So short answers, please, before we, 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 uh, we're told to stop. But Peter, um, I mentioned in the, in the introduction how investors uh, needed to invest in green sectors and green assets. And uh, it's great news about the, the Hapag Lloyd investment getting green certification. But do you see any impact um, on investor appetite um, due to the regulation we've just been discussing, including, quite importantly, differences between the US, where you're based, Asia, 
and European investors, in, in particularly in relation to to LNG? Uh, you know, I think I think Jacob said it before as well. Uh, the the consumer around the world is getting more and more uh, educated, if you will, on environmental issues. And I think uh, Europe has typically been the leader in that. Uh, the U.S. is certainly following. We see Asia following or certain areas in Asia following. Uh, but that's a trend that will continue. And that's a trend that will continue very aggressively. And at the end of the day, all of us in business or those of us that have been in business understand that it is the ultimate consumer that governs. And the more the ultimate consumer wants and demands environmental uh, consciousness from from their uh, from their suppliers and from those that sell them products, uh, the more shipping and logistics and and those product development people uh, will move to environmental benefits. We certainly see that now in the automotive industry and the PCTCs. So it's gonna it's gonna follow in all of our other industries, and ultimately the consumer will govern. I totally agree with you. I totally agree with that. Um, okay, guys, it's time to the, for the final question, and I'd, I'd ask for a 30-second answer from each of you. It's time to put your expertise to the test and put your crystal goggles on. 30, um, 30 seconds is really tough, Paul. Oh, well, okay, and a little bit longer maybe. But, uh, but um, look, it, it's generally accepted that shipping needs to have commercially viable zero-carbon fuels by 2030. Will shipping have met this target? Um, and what role will LNG have played um, up to, to that point? And the very difficult one, how confident are you that LNG will play a role beyond that? And I'm going to go to Jakob first. Answer is yes. <laughs> I do think that will play a significant role. Yes, I do. And, it, and I do think that the push now with, with bio LNG just proves that. Uh, and then that we see that the talk of hydrogen and ammonia, when we do have sustainable production of, of hydrogen, then we might as well produce synthetic methane. And then you have the complete circle uh, and you have a solution for the future. So yes, LNG will be there to play a significant role, not only due to the infrastructure, but that the owners, the ship owners, they need to have a safe investment right now that will future-proof the asset towards that. Perfect, thank you, Jakob. Tolson. Yes, uh, in line with our maritime forecast to 2050, of course, it shows that there will be an uptake uh, of low carbon and carbon neutral fuels is essential to meet the uh, IMO greenhouse gas goals. And uh, under all scenarios uh, we have uh, analyzed uh, in all pathways, uh, LNG, bio LNG and synthetic LNG will provide a large portion, a large part uh, of the fuel mix at uh, 2050. And uh, this part will be uh, significant and uh, exceeding about 30% uh, of the total fuel consumption at 2050. So very confident. Thank you, Torsten. That's, that's very good news to know this. And um, last and not least, Peter, give us your wisdom. We, we, we will only make it if we act now. As we've said before, waiting is not an option. We need to use the available resources we have now, which is LNG, and, uh, and introduce bio uh, with that as quickly as we can, uh, at which point we can start to meet the 2030 and 2050 deadlines, guidelines. Without, without acting now, we will never get there. Thank you, Peter. Thank you to you all. Thanks to you all for, for the panel. I think I have been timed out. Um, so I'm going to, probably with no further ado, um, a hand back to Mike. You just made a ball. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, to our session four panelists and presenters, to Paul and our LNG pathway speakers. It's a great opportunity to dive deeper into that subject. We really appreciate uh, the discussion. Uh, to Stefan and Ralph, who preceded you for their extra effort in executing the in-person interview, a rare uh, feat these days. Uh, speaking of in-person, I was asked to remind you that the Hamburg event I mentioned on 31st of August is planned as an in-person event. Uh, 
we hope it will happen. Uh, now I would like to thank all our panelists and presenters over the course of the four sessions today. It's been fascinating, uh, stimulating, um, inspiring really. Thanks, thanks to our partner, ENB, uh, and to our corporate sponsors for making the event possible. As Rasmus uh, of Trafagura said earlier, we have a huge responsibility uh, to reach these goals uh, and was pointed out many times. And as Marine Money Chairman Jim Lawrence uh, said in his opening remarks, we have to support each other um, in these efforts. We have at Marine Money have a lot planned for you in the year ahead. Please keep on the lookout and please let us know if we can help you in any way. Thanks again, everyone, and farewell until we meet again. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Bye.